I have the best story ever to work with, as all paleontologists do. You know, we just have to tell the story because it's better than fiction. I was always interested in the earth and in rocks and in dinosaurs and honestly, I don't understand why everybody isn't a geologist or a paleontologist. You know, when you're seeing something that no human has ever seen before, when every day you get to know a little something that no human has ever known before, those are the moments that I live for and I think, you know, any field scientist would relate to that. Dinosaur remains measuring 26 meters long and weighing 59,000 kilos have been uncovered in Argentina. Scientists found the 77 million year old Drenautus in southern Patagonia. They say the fossil was remarkably well preserved. There's no remote way of finding dinosaurs. You, you have to know your geology, you have to know how to be outdoors, and you get your boots on the ground and you literally walk until you see a bone sticking out of the rock. I had been working with a, a team of fellow paleontologists from the University of Pennsylvania in Baharia Oasis of Egypt. And we went there in 2000, 2001 to try to recover what were known as the lost dinosaurs of Egypt. These are four species of amazing dinosaurs. One of them was Spinosaurus. They were excavated by a German scientist named Ernst Stromer von Reichenbach. In 1911, he, he discovered these species, excavated them, brought them to the Bavarian Museum of Paleontology, uh, and then they were bombed in World War II and destroyed. And like most dinosaur species, they were known from single specimens. And so those species were wiped out of science and they became known as the lost dinosaurs of Egypt. So we went back there in 2000 to try to discover these. I, I worked with Stromer's family. I had his journals and old photographs and actually found the Spinosaurus quarry. And I dug there and I found 100-year-old German newsprint and, and burlap and plaster and sardine cans, but he didn't leave a single bone behind. But in the course of looking elsewhere in the oasis, we discovered a giant dinosaur which turned out to be, uh, at the time, the world's second largest dinosaur. We named it Paralatitan, which means tidal giant, because we could see it was a giant plant-eating dinosaur, quadrupedal, long neck, long tail, think Brontosaurus, um, that lived in a tidal mangrove. I'd say that wet my appetite for these giant dinosaurs. And, you know, it would have been cool to find like the fifth or sixth largest dinosaur. Find the second kind of ticked me off a little bit. <laughs> Always remember, if you ain't first, you're last. So I set my sights on southernmost Patagonia in Argentina, down near Tierra del Fuego, a place that had rocks of the right age, that were sedimentary rocks, that were exposed in vast badlands. Think of the Badlands National Park in South Dakota times like 20. It was about a thousand kilometers away from where any other paleontologist was working. And there was a single note from a German who went down this river in, in 1922 that he spotted some fragments of dinosaur bones. And so that was like the perfect situation for me. So I went down there first in 2004, um, near the end of that field season, we found a 2.2 meter femur. That's seven foot one inch. It was about a meter around, one of the biggest bones of any kind that have ever been found. That bone was isolated, but it made us hungry to go back for more. So I go back the next year, and on the first day of that field season, find another almost two meter femur. Only that bone was not isolated. And we, we dug at this location for an additional four field seasons. I spent over a year of my life living in a tent uh, next to this animal. We ended up excavating 145 giant bones of a new genus and species of plant-eating dinosaur. I named it Dreadnoughtus. Because all fleshed out in life, it would have weighed 65 tons. That's the mass of 13 African elephants. That's the mass of nine T-Rex. That's about 10 tons heavier than a Boeing 737. I don't know what the hell you feeding him, but he is too damn big! And so, if you are that big, what have you to fear? Uh, except perhaps gravity, and thus the name fears nothing or dread not us. 
Uh, Dreadnoughtus was a really interesting creature. When, when you get that big, you have to have all kinds of evolutionary uh, innovations just to survive. Like, how do you have limbs that can support that kind of weight? I mean, clearly it could. I think one of its biggest metabolic challenges is shedding heat. If you took elephant anatomy and scaled an elephant up to 65 tons, I think its flesh would literally cook inside of its body because it wouldn't be able to shed heat efficiently enough. So that long neck and long tail that these sauropod dinosaurs have are basically giant radiators. So they have a lot of surface area per volume. Plus they don't have bellows lungs like, like us mammals do. They have what we call bird-like lungs, which really should be called dinosaur lungs because dinosaurs predate birds. It's two sets of lungs that are kind of like a two-stroke engine. And it's an efficient way to circulate air, but we think they were also attached to a pneumatic system that invaded their axial skeleton, their spine, so that they could take heat from, from their neck and their tail and uh, all over their body through their respiratory system and dump it out that way. And then that long neck is basically a feeding apparatus. So a dreadnoughtus could stand in one place so with that long neck clear out a huge envelope of vegetation, taking in tens of thousands of calories do that for an hour or two and then go boop, 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 move, you know, a little bit to the one side or the other and do it again. You should floss them. Their stomach is the size of a horse and it's this big bacteria vat surrounded by a mountain of flesh. And so they just gulp down the vegetation and let the bacteria do all the work. So again, it's super efficient. And so these dinosaurs achieved incredible things, things that must be on the edge of what is biologically possible indoors in laboratories. Now we're beginning to study dinosaurs in the way that a biologist would study a, a raccoon or an otter today. And so, you know, we use a lot of technology now. We use, you know, synchrotrons and CT scanning and 3D technologies. Scientists named Mary Schweitzer, as well as uh, Beth Shapiro here at Colossal, were some of the founders of, of a new field of study that is molecular paleontology. And so now we are routinely recovering ancient biomolecules from dinosaurs and other extinct creatures, proteins, blood vessels, possibly blood cells, bone building cells. And so I'm hopeful that in the laboratory, we will uh, begin to learn more and more about dinosaurs.